Ashley Brock, Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 5. Grace had a morning full of chores. The first load of laundry went in at 7.15 while the coffee was brewing and her eyes were still mostly shut. She watered her porch plants in the little pots of herbs on her kitchen windowsill and yawned hugely. As the coffee began to sip the air and gave her hope, she washed the glass and bowls Julie had used the night before. While babysitting, she closed the open bag of potato chips, tucked it into its place in the cupboard, then wiped the crumbs from the counter while Julie had her snack while talking on the phone. Julie Coder was known for her neatness, but she loved Aubrey. At precisely 7.30 and after a half a cup of coffee, Aubrey wrote, Reliable as the sunrise, Grace stopped heading, heading out of the tiny gallery kitchen toward the bedroom off the living room. Rain or shine, week there, weekend, Aubrey's internal clock buzzed away at 7.30 every morning. Grace could have left her in the crib and finished coffee, but she looked forward to this moment every day. Aubrey stood at the side of the crib, her sunbeam curls tangled from sleep, her cheeks still flushed with it. Grace could still remember the first time she'd come and seen Aubrey standing, her arm and legs rocking, her face glowering with success and surprise. Now Aubrey's legs seemed to sturdy, so sturdy. She slipped in one, then the other, in a kind of joyful march. She laughed out loud when Grace came into the room. Mama, Mama, hi, my Mama. Hello, my baby. Grace leaned over the side for the first nuzzle inside. She knew how lucky she was. There couldn't have been a child on the planet with a sunnier nature than her little girl. How's my Aubrey? Up, out. You bet. Gotta pee? Gotta pee. Aubrey agreed and giggled when Grace lifted her out of the crib. Until the train was coming along, Grace decided to check in Aubrey's overnight diaper as they headed into the bathroom. It had its hits and misses. Aubrey hit it this time, and Grace launched into the lavish praise over bold leaf functions that only a parent with a toddler could understand. Teeth and hair were brushed, and in the closet size bathroom, Grace had brightened up with mint green walls and all each trip cut. Then the breakfast routine began. Aubrey wanted cold cereal with bananas, but no milk. She popped her hand over the bowl when Grace started to pour it on, shaking her head. Warm. No, Mama. No. Cup, please. Okay. Milk and a cup. Grace filled one, set it on the high chair tray beside the bowl. Eat up now. We've got lots to do today. Do what? Let's see. Grace made herself a piece of toast while she went through the project day. We had to finish the laundry, then we promised Mrs. West we'd wash her windows today. Three hour job, Grace estimated. Then we have to go to the market. I'll be gasping. Pleasure. Miss Lucy! Yes, you'll see Miss Lucy. Lucy Winslow Wilson was one of Aubrey's favorite people. Supermarket cashier always had a smile and a lollipop for Aubrey. After we put the groceries away, we're going to the Quince. Seth! Milk dribbled out of her grin. Well, honey, I don't know for certain that he'll be there today. Uh, he may be out on the boat with Ethan or over at his friend's house. Seth! Aubrey said again very differently. Her mouth puckered up in her stubborn pout. We'll see. Grace mopped up the field. Ethan! Maybe. Duckies! Foolish for sure. She kissed the top of Aubrey's head, gave herself the luxury of a second cup of coffee. At 8.15, Grace was armed with a stack of newspapers and a spray bottle that contained a mixture of vinegar and pneumonia. Aubrey was entertaining herself on the grass with her malty sciense. Every few seconds, a cow mood or pick oinked, and Aubrey nearly never failed to echo the, song, the sound. By the time Aubrey had switched her affections to her building blocks, Grace had finished cleaning and polishing the outside of the windows. The front and side of the cottage and was right on schedule. She would have stayed on schedule if Miss West hadn't come out with tall glasses of iced tea and decided to chat. I don't know how to thank you for seeing to this for me, Grace. Miss West, the grandmother of Minnie, had brought Aubrey a drink in a bright plastic cup with ducks on the side. I'm happy to do it, Miss West. Just got like just can't do like I used to with my arthritis, and I do like my windows to shine. She smiled, deepening the wrinkles on her weathered, scored face. And you do make them shine. My granddaughter Layla said how she'd wash them for me. But to tell you the truth, and shame the devil, Grace, that girl's a scatterbrain. She, she'd like as not start the job and end up slipping in the vegetable patch. Sleeping in the vegetable patch. Don't know what's to become of that girl. Grace laughed and scrubbed the next window. She's only 15. Her mind's on boys and clothes and music. Tell me. Mrs. West nodded so vigorously that her second chin wobbled with the movement. Why, at her age, I could pick a crab clean faster than you could blink. Earn my keep and keep my mind on my work till the work was done. She went. Then I thought about boys. She let out a hearty laugh. Where's my own That's one pretty little 
That's one pretty little lamb you've got yourself there, Gracie. The light of my life. Good as gold, too. Why, my college youngest boy, Luke, he's not stu He's not still for two minutes running and spends every waking hour looking for trouble. Just last week, I caught him climbing up my polar curtains like a house cat. Still smelling around in trouble. He's a terror, that Luke is. Aubrey has her moments, too. Can't believe it. Not with that, that angel face. You're going to have to beat the boys off with a stick to keep them from sniffing around that sweetheart one of these days. Pretty as a picture. I already seen her holding hands with one. Grace bottled her spray bottle. Looked around quickly to make certain her little girl hadn't grown up while she was on. Aubrey? Mrs. Wells left. Walking on the water from him with that clean boy. The new one. Oh, Seth. Since her hoop was so ridiculous, Grace set the bottle down and picked up her glass to drink. Aubrey's got a crush on him. Good looking boy. My young Matt goes to school with him. Told me how Seth came to sock that little bully Robert right now. In a few weeks ago. Couldn't help but feel it was about time somebody did. How they doing over there at the Quinns? The question was her main purpose for coming out. But Mrs. West believed in leading up to matters. Just fine. Miss West rolled her eyes. This pump needed more priming. That girl came up. And Mary, she was beautiful. She'll have to have quick hands, too, to keep that one in line. Always was wild. I think Anna can handle herself. Handle him. Went off to some foreign place to honeymoon, didn't they? Rome, Seth showed me a postcard they sent. It's beautiful. Always puts me in mind of that movie with Aubrey Hepburn and Gorda Peck, where she's a princess. Don't make movies like that anymore. Roman Holiday. Grace smiled wistfully. She had a weakness for the classic and romantic. That's the one. Grace looked a bit like Audrey Hepburn, Miss West Muse. Coloring was wrong, of course. With Grace being blonde as a Viking, well, she had the big eyes and the cool, pretty face. Lord knew she was skinny enough. Never been any place foreign, which included, in Miss West's mind, two-thirds of the United States. They're coming back soon. A couple of days. Hmm. Well, that house needs a woman, no question. Can't imagine what it's like over there. Four males in one house. Must smell like a gym sock half the time. Don't know a man on this earth who can manage to pee and hit the toilet with the with the whole stream. Grace laughed and went back to her window. They aren't so bad. The fact is, Cam was keeping the house pretty well before they hired me to take over. But the only one of them who remembers to empty the pockets for tossing his pants at the hamper is Philip. If that's the worst of it, it's not bad. I expect Cam's wife will take over the house once they get back. Grace and Titan on her wand of newspaper as her heart did a quick break. I, she works full time in Princess Annie. Annie, most likely she'll take over, Miss Winston. A woman likes her house kept her way. Best thing for the boy, I expect, having a woman there full time. Don't know what Ray was thinking of this time around. I swear, good heart of man he was, but once Stella passed, shifted his mornings. Moorings. I'd say a man his age taking on a boy that way, no matter what was that, what. Not that I believe one word of the nasty officers we hear now and then. Nancy Claymore as well, slapping her lips every chance she gets. Mrs. West, West waited a beat, opened that graceful flappers with Grace was frowning. Tilling one. You know, if that insurance inspector would come around again. No, Grace was quiet. I don't. I hope not. Don't see how it makes a matter where the boy came from as far as the insurance company goes, even if they did suicide himself, and I'm not saying it's so. They can't prove it, can't they? They can't prove it, can they? Besides, she paused dramatically as she did whatever she made the argument. They weren't there. She said the last on a note of triumph, just as she had when she made the same statement to Nancy. Professor Quinn wouldn't have killed himself, Grace Mom. Of course not, but it did make for such interesting talk. But the boy, she broke off her ears, perking up. There goes my telephone. You just let yourself in when you want to do in this side, Grace, she said as he heard off. Grace said nothing, kept working steadily, but her mind was whirling. Shamed her, shamed her that she couldn't con concentrate on Professor Quinn. She could think only of herself and what it ha might happen. Would Anna come back from Rome and want to take over the house? Would Grace lose her job there and the extra money that went with it? Worse, much worse, would she lose the op those opportunities to see Ethan once or twice a week, share a meal now and then? She gotten used to even a dependent on being part of his life, even a peripheral part, she realized. And as pathetic as it was, she loved folding his clothes, smoothing the sheets on his bed. She even allowed herself to believe that he would think of her when he found one of the 
her little nose around the house, or slip between freshly laundered sheets at night. Was she going to lose that, too? Lose the pleasure of seeing him coming in from his boat, or scooping Aubrey up when she demanded a kiss, or glancing over at her, giving her that slow smile? Was all that going to be the only picture she tucked away in her mind now? Her days would go on and on without even that to look forward to, and her nights would go on and on alone? She squeezed her eyes to struggling with despair, then opened them again when Aubrey tugged at him and began, Mama, Miss Lucy. Soon, honey, because she needed to, Grace lifted Aubrey in her arms for a fierce hug. It was nearly one by the time Grace finished putting away the groceries and fixed Aubrey's lunch. She was only half an hour behind. She thought she could make that up within, without too much trouble. It just meant moving a little quicker and keeping her mind on work. No more projecting. She ordered herself as she strapped Aubrey into the car seat. No more fools. Set, 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 Aubrey chatted, bouncing madly. We'll see. Grace climbed behind the wheel, put the key in the ignition, and turned it over. The response was wheezing. Oh, no. You don't? No, you don't? I don't have time for this. A little panic. She turned the key again, popped the gas pedal, and sighed was relieving the energy car. That's more like it. She muttered as she backed out of the short drive. Here we go, Aubrey. Here we go. Five minutes later, midway between her house and the Quinns, the old sedan coughed again, shuddered, then belched out steam from under the hood. Damn it! Damn it! <laughs> Aubrey echoed joyfully. Grace only pressed the heels of her hands to her eyes. It was the radiator. She was sure of it. Last month it had been the fan belt. Before that, the brake pads resigned. She eased on, eased to the side of the road and got out to open the hood. Smoke bellowed. Made her cough and step away. Resolution. She swallowed back the nod of despair in her throat. Maybe it wouldn't be anything major. It could just be the sun belt again. If it wasn't. She sighed, usually. She would have to decide if it was better to pump more money into this wreck or to worry her brother's budget and to buy another wreck. Either way, there was nothing to be done about it now. She opened the passenger side door. I'm going to go, Aubrey. The car is sick again, honey. Aw. Yeah, so we're going to have to leave it right here. Alone? Aubrey's concern over inanimate objects made Grace smile again. Not for long. I'm going to call the car man to come and take care of him. Make it feel well better? I hope so. Now we're going to walk to Seth's house. Okay, delighted by the change of routine. Aubrey set out of a scramble. A quarter mile later, Grace was carrying her. It was a pretty day, she reminded herself, and walking gave her a chance to look and really see. Honeysuckle was tangled along the fence that bordered a tiny field of soybeans, and the scent was lovely. She picked off a blossom for Aubrey. By the time they skirted the marsh that ended, Edge Quinley and her arms were aching. They stopped to study a turtle sunning on the sand. Side of the road to let Aubrey giggle over the way head retreated into a shell when she reached out to him. Can you walk for a while now, baby? Tired. With her eyes beating, Aubrey lifted her arm. Up. Okay. Up you come. Nearly there. It was past nap time, Grace thought. Aubrey wanted her nap directly after lunch every day. She would sleep for two hours, almost to the minute, then wake up ready to roll. Aubrey's head was already a snoozing weight on Grace's shoulder. She climbed the porch and slipped into the house. When she had her daughter tucked onto the couch, she hurried upstairs to strip beds, gathering short laundry. With the first load in, she had made a quick call to the mechanic who did his best to keep her ailing car alive. She rushed upstairs again, remaking the beds with fresh sheets to save herself steps. She kept cleaning supplies on each floor. Grace tackled the bathroom first, scrubbing and rinsing and flurry until chrome and towel sparkled. It would be, she realized, her last full hit on the Quinn place before came and Anna returned. But she already decided sometime during the mile walk from her broken down car to carve out a couple of hours from a quick polish the day they were expected home. She had pride in her work, didn't she? Certainly another woman would notice the tidiness, the clean counters, the few extra touches she tried to add. A professional woman like Anna, a woman with a determined career, would see when she, a grace, was needed here. She raced downstairs again to check on Aubrey to drag wet clothes out of the washer into a basket and put the second load in. She would make sure they were fresh flowers in the master bedroom when the newlyweds returned, and she put on... The good fingertip towels. She would leave a note for Philip to pick up some fruit so she could arrange it prettily in the bowl on the kitchen table. She'd make time to pace past wax the hardwood floors and wash and iron the curtains. She unclosed on the line quickly without any of her unusual enjoyment in the task. Still, the simple routine began to calm her. Everything would be all right somehow. She got herself swaying. Sugar had to clear it. Fatigue had come quickly, like a punch to the jab. If she had bothered to calculate the time she'd been on her feet moving that day, she would have counted seven hours on a short five-hour sleep the night before. What she did calculate was that she had another twelve to go, and she needed a break. Ten minutes, she promised herself, and as she sometimes did on a long day, stretched out right in the grass by the clothes that waved on the line, ten-minute nap would recharge her system 
and still give her time to scrub down the kitchen before Aubrey woke up. Ethan drove home from the waterfront. He cut his day on the water short, let Jim and his son take the work boat out again, check the pots in the poke and moke, set the was off with Danny and Will, and Ethan figured on grabbing himself a quick and delayed lunch, then spending the next hour hours at the boatyard. He wanted to finish the cockpit, maybe get the roof of the cabin started. The more he managed to do, the less time it would be before Cam could get into the finish. And fancy work. He slowed down when he saw Grace's car on the side of the road, then pulled out, qu pulled over quickly. He only shook his head when he looked under the open hood. Damn thing was held together with spitting prayers. He decided shouldn't be, she shouldn't be driving something so unreliable. Just what if he thought so the goddamn thing had decided to break down when she'd be coming home from the pub in the middle of the night? Took a closer look and hissed through his teeth. The radiator was dead lost, and if she was entertaining the idea of replacing it, he'd just have to talk her out of it. He would find her a decent second-hand car, fix it up for her, or ask him for new engines, like Midas' new gold, to tune it up. He wasn't having to drive around a wreck like this with the baby, too. Caught himself took a couple steps back. It wasn't any of his business. The hell was it, he thought, with an uncasual flash of temper. She was a friend, was she? He had a right to help out a friend, especially one who needed some looking after. And God knew whether or not Grace did that she needed some looking after. Got back in his truck, drove home with a scrowl on his face. He nearly slammed the screen door before he saw Aubrey curled up on the couch. Scrowl didn't have a chance. He eased the door shut and walked quietly over to her. Her hand was bunched into fists on the cushion, unable to resist. He took it gently and marveled at those tiny, perfect fingers. She had a bow around one of her curls, a little ribbon of blue lace that he imagined Grace had tied on that morning. It was lopsided now, and only sweeter for it. <laughs> he couldn't help hoping that she worked before he had to head out again. But now he needed to find Aubrey's mother in disgust for reliable transportation. Because he said, decided it was too quiet for her to be upstairs doing whatever it was she did up there. Walked into the kitchen, noted that the signs of a hurried breakfast were still in evidence. She hadn't gotten to that yet. The washing machine was humming, and he caught a glimpse, clothes flapping in the breeze on the line outside. The minute he stepped to the door, he saw her, and hit full panic. He didn't know what he thought, only that she was lying on the grass. Tim was of illness and injury crowded into his head as he rushed outside. He was barely one full stride away from her when he realized she wasn't unconscious. She was sleeping. Curled up much as her daughter was inside. One fist bunched near her cheek. Her breathing slowed and deep and even. He came into his weakened knees and sat down beside her, waiting for his heartbeat to return to something approaching normal. He sat, listening to the clothes flapping the line to the water lick the ear lick grass to the birds chattering while he wondered what the hell he was going to do with her in the end he simply sighed rose then bending down gathered her up into his arms she stirred in them snuggled made his blood run a little too fast for comfort ethan she murmured turning her face into the curve of his neck and enticing the bright fantasy of rolling over the sun warm grass with her Ethan, she said again, skimming her fingers along his shoulder, making him hard as iron. Then again, Ethan, only this time in a squeak of shock as she jerked her head up, stared at him. Her eyes were dazed, sleep and bright with surprise. Her mouth was made a soft O oh, that was gloriously tempting. The, the collar fluttered. She, what? What is it? She managed over some churning combination of arousal and embarrassment. You're going to take a nap. You got to have some, as much sense as Aubrey and take it inside out of the sun. He knew his voice was rough. He couldn't do anything about it. The sour had him by the throat. It was gleeful, nippy, claws. I was just... Scared ten years off me when I saw you lying there. I thought you fainted or something. I only stretched out for a minute. Aubrey was sleeping, so... Aubrey! I need to check on Aubrey! I just did. She's fine. You'd have showed more sense if you stretched out on the couch with her. I don't come here to sleep. You were sleeping. Just for a minute. You need more than a minute. No, I don't. It's just that things got complicated today and my brain got tired. It almost amused him. Stopped in the kitchen, still holding her. Looked into her eyes. Your brain got tired. Yeah, it nearly shut off entirely now. I need to rest my mind a minute, that's all. Put me down, Ethan. He wasn't ready to, not quite yet. Saw your car about a mile down the road from here. I called Dave and told him he's going to get to it as soon as he can. You walked from there to here, Carton Aubrey? No, my chauffeur drove us. Put me down, he said, for six loaded. Well, you can give your chauffeur the rest of the day off. I'll drive you home when Aubrey wakes up. I can get my cell phone. I barely started on the house. Now I need to get back to it. You're not walking two and a half miles. I'll call Julie. She'll run down and pick us up. You must have work to do yourself. I'm... 
behind schedule since I'm desperate now. I can't catch up if you don't put me down. You consider her. There's not much to you. The shimmer of her knee wavered, wavered into noise. If you're gonna tell me I'm skinny, I wouldn't say skinny. You got fine bones, that's all. Smooth soft flesh to cover them. He set her on her feet before he forgot he intended to look after her. You don't have to worry about the house today. I do. I need to do my job. Her nerves were just a mess. The way he was looking at her made her want to take one flying leap back into his arms and almost made her want to hightail it out of the back door like a rabbit. She never spared such a dramatic type of war her system could only stand her ground. I can do it quicker if you aren't underfoot. I'll get out of your way as soon as you call Julie and see if she'll come by and get you. Reached up and brushed some dandelion fluff out of her hair. Okay, she turned punched the numbers on the kitchen phone. Maybe it would be bad, she thought wildly as the phone started to ring. Ivana didn't want her around after she got home. It seemed she couldn't be with ease for ten minutes anyway without getting jumpy. If it kept up, she was bound to do something to embarrass them both. End of chapter five.